So uh, yeah, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's been awesome, and I hope everyone had like a great lunch. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, hacking JTAG routers and even doing that before getting it outside out of the box uh, through the power of emulation. So hi, uh, I'm Philippe Lorret. I'm a senior security researcher at Trellix. I do Avon research, I hack stuff all over the place, and then we write blogs and talk about it. If you want, you can find me on Twitter at uh, phlol. So uh, today I'm going to talk about this project that took like two or three months um, that involves unpacking and emulating a JTAG firmware. So that's uh, it's like little known information online about those firmware, so that's interesting. And um, I will look at two different models, uh, one running MIPS, one on like Arch64, and they all they share like more or less the same code base. And eventually I found like a pre-auth uh, remote code execution. Um, 200,000 devices are affected, uh, were affected uh, according to Shodan, and that covers something like 20 different models uh, from JTEC. So let's go over the, the process uh, I went through. So here two examples of uh, JTEC devices. Uh, on the left is like more like a small one, like a home office type of things. Uh, it's like the 29, 27, I think. And on the right one, on the right side, that's the most beefy one they have. Uh, it's called JTEC 39, uh, Vigor 3910. And so yeah, this one is uh, like the top tier they have and covers like, um, can do like something like uh, 500 simultaneous like uh, VPN connection and that type of things. So you can also see them in uh, like more uh, natural habitat. Um, but yeah, so why, why should you care about JTEC? Um, turns out they're like, really good for like small businesses. Uh, they're like not too pricey. And as I said, they offer like VPN concentration and stuff. So, um, you know, when suddenly everyone has to work from home, uh, that's kind of useful. And somehow they're pretty popular in the, in the UK and uh, Vietnam. I think for UK, it's for like historical reason. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Vietnam. Um, you can see on Shodan that if you search JTEC, you can find something like 700,000 uh, results, and a good like third of it is like in the UK. Um, this one is a little more spicy. Uh, that uh, all the firmware from 2019 uh, that are vulnerable to the stuff I'm going to talk about. So you can see like 80,000 of those. Uh, but uh, there's also firmware from 2018, 20, 21, etc. That are also vulnerable. So it's just like a slice of the, the data. And I had to obscure the, uh, the queries so that, you know, script kiddies don't try to DDoS them. Um, interestingly, uh, the CISA, uh, which is kind of like the US equivalent of DNC or something like that, uh, reported that uh, the People's Republic of China was targeting uh, so devices and the edge uh, routers, and Draytech is on the list. Um, in that case, uh, one of the devices targeted was the Vigor uh, 3900, which is the predecessor of the 3910. Um, so that, that kind of shows like a bit of the relevance of uh, what I'm talking about today. And similarly, uh, a few months ago, uh, Black Lotus Labs um, talked about the zero rat uh, threat actor or malware that was also targeting uh, JTEC devices. So it's all fresh and, and current and threat actors are actually going after those. So what would be the attack surface for these devices? Um, the, one of the most obvious one is the uh, web management interface. So that's like the web page you visit to configure your stuff. Uh, there's like a, actually like uh, over like 100 CGI endpoints, and that's kind of what I'm going to cover today. And uh, by default, it's exposed on the LAN. And if you go out of your way, you can enable it to be also accessible from the internet. So the um, 200 dev 200,000 devices that I was talking about that are like vulnerable, uh, they were configured to be uh, put online. Uh, other protocols that would have been interesting or could be like OpenVPN or WireGuard, uh, and it's true, like other like more complicated protocols that are like exposed by that device. Um, and there are also like LAN ones like Radius or LDAP or what have you, if you wanted, but probably like if you're already on the LAN, that might not be as interesting. So how do we go about looking at the firmware of that device? Um, just to give you a quick TLDR, what's going on, and like a bit of spoilers. So the main operating system of these devices is called DreOS, uh, and there are like over 20 different devices that use it. Uh, most of them are MIPS or Arch64. Most of them are running that bare metal, uh, and some exception or exist, and uh, we're going to see one later, but I don't want to spoil that yet. Uh, and it's like a more or less a real-time operating system, so you have multiple tasks and, and so on. 
And so today we're going to focus on some uh, 29 something uh, Vigor, which is like MIPS based, and the Vigor 3910 with R64. Uh, but to get there, we need to go through multiple layers of compression and packing that we want to uh, decompress and unpack. So where do you find the firmware? Uh, in the title of my presentation, I'm promising that we're going to do it before getting the device out of the box. So the usual trick of you know opening it and opening the device and you know dumping the flash one way or another is kind of like out of the window right now. And instead, uh, conveniently, the Draytech website lets you download um, firmware and you don't need to register, you don't need nothing. Um, on the website itself, they just list you know the most recent firmware and maybe like the, the one stable release before. But if you uh, truncate the uh, the URL and look at like parent folder, you can actually get the list of like all the previous uh, firmware from like the last like five or ten years, which will prove to be useful. So when I started my project, I was like, I'm going to go after the latest version of the BFS they have, and that's what I got uh, on the right side, like opening it in the hex editor. It's I don't know if you guys can see. Um, it says here like enc encrypted image, and then it's all like all junk. And I was like, oh crap, it's all, uh, it's encrypted. Um, and if you don't just eyeball it, you can also look at the entropy um, and it's like flat one. So everything is encrypted. So I was like, yeah, let's let's move on to a different device. Uh, let's see something else. And so I, I picked that one kind of randomly like on the website and I was like, let's see. So I don't know if you can see, but the, um, the um, there's like more patterns that you can see emerging, like a bunch of null bytes and so on. So this one does not look like it's uh, encrypted. And um, if we look at the entropy, like it looks completely different on the previous one. So, um, th so that's the one I'm going to start with. But before, you know, like rushing, we should also search like what's what's the state of the art, like what's what are the tools that we can find. Uh, there is one called Dre Tools, and there's like something like 60 uh, folks on GitHub, but the last update was like seven years ago. So likely like modern firmware would not work with that tool because you know like stuff changes, but it mentions that um, the firmware is compressed and encrypted. So that kind of like matches some of the expectation we could have. And uh, it's also mentioned that it's going to use LZO uh, compression. So maybe that would be relevant, but you know, everything to be taken with a grain of salt because it's like seven years old. Uh, another tool that's also uh, that's more recent and actually much more accurate is that one um, for the Vigor 165, which actually one I didn't look at, but they mentioned that the f compressed firmware start with some like magic bytes, and when it's mapped in memory, it start at like, a certain location uh, that put in the red boxes, and it also says it's MIPS, so that's getting close to what we're interested in. Uh, but one of the problem was like that tools comes with no documentation. And so, you know, if it doesn't work and you don't understand how it's supposed to work, like you're kind of stuck. So uh, the next step is like, I'm going to try to make my own tools that would like do something like that. So how you do that? Uh, the first step is to try to import that in IDA uh, because I, I love IDA Pro. Uh, some people in the room love Ghidra, so to each their own. Um, but so you pick a firmware file, uh, that's one of them, like from the, uh, the one that we were looking before that's not fully encrypted. And the first assumption we're making is that there is something to actually look at in IDA. So, you know, it's not fully encrypted, it's not fully compressed, so there is something to look at. And then the steps are, we want to figure out what's the architecture of our firmware. Um, so like the common ones are like MIPS, ARM, PPC. And the idea is you just like try to import it in IDA at some random location and try to define stuff as code. If it works and if it looks like legit, like you, you probably find the right architecture and otherwise you just keep trying. And the same, like another important feature you want to, you need to figure out is at which load address you need to put your firmware. Because in this situation, it's like a, it's a raw binary file. It's not like a P file or ELF file. IDA doesn't know where to put it in memory. So usually what you do is you kind of try to guesstimate the, the location um, so that um, if you find like function pointers or interrupt table handlers or pointer to strings or anything that would be like an absolute address, you want to find the right load address that would make like all of the stuff that like absolute addresses work. So to give an example, if you find printf function and it's clearly taking a, an absolute address to a string as a first argument, you want to make sure that when you pick a, a load address, your the thing pointed by an address looks like the beginning of a string. Um, and for just like getting the ball rolling, I was like, let's pick a uh, random address of like X1000 and see what happens. 
So in that case, I already like try and was like, oh, this is th this looks like MIPS uh, if you recognize that. But what we can see in these two red boxes is it's loading an address in an immediate value in the uh, T9 register, and then it jumps to that. So that is like clearly like a function call, and that's telling us that you have code at the 824 something address. So that is giving us a hint of what could be the load address. Um, and so in that case, eventually by trial and error, like I narrowed down as like, yes, it's MIPS B, so big Indian, and the load address is the one in orange. And it turns out after the fact that, yeah, that was exactly the same address that was uh, provided in that um, GitHub script I mentioned before. And to give you an idea of what it looks like um, once it's imported correctly, that's the, um, the beginning of the firmware. And if we scroll a little, um, we can see a first function that just like scroll by. That, that, oops, sorry, that's what I was uh, showing you just before. But then um, we jump like the second function call turns out to like point still point to like junk data, and that's because um, it's compressed data that's going to be decompressed in place. Um, so that's that's a valuable information to see. Uh, oops, crap. Uh, sorry, I messed up. We do it again. Um, so we, we can scroll through the, the stuff, as I said. And um, yeah, so that's that's the second function call. And this is not good. It's not a good one. And it's, it's going to be decompressed. So the first function call that's just above is likely going to be responsible for doing the decompression. And here we can see um, some of the magic bytes, the ma magic values that were like mentioned in the, in the script previously. And um, I've like, highlighted like in my comments that there's like a pointer to like some data that is actually the compressed uh, the compressed firmware. And here we can see like a size that's kind of like by trial and error. And we, it's like a small value. And if we add it to our current location, we realize, well, that's the end of the, the stuff. Plus all the magic bytes that we were like talking about before. I like that. And we can see that we have like a little bit of con control flow, and then we jump in that function that is going to be responsible for doing the actual decompression. I, I label the arguments, and basically it takes like an address of the uh, thing to be decompressed, its size, like the destination, the destination size, some magic parameters, I'm not sure what they do, and finally like a pointer to like an integer that will receive like the decompressed size. Um, that that would be like you can figure it out by you know doing a bit more of reversing of the not the core algorithm but just like the um, peripheral things around it. And here we can see that if something goes wrong, it jumps to the left and it's going to print like an error string in the console because this type of devices that usually have like a serial console that you can look at. Um, and so. Uh, with that, we just have like an idea of like, okay, we've located the function. We have an idea of what would be like error scenarios. So what, what do we do next? Um, so ju just to uh, summarize what I just showed, we were expecting the decompression routine to be at the beginning of the firmware, and that was the case. Uh, we were like expecting some magic words and we find them. And the main function like that we're looking is jumping into junk code because we have decompression in place. So that once the thing is decompressed properly, we should have something nice. So yeah, how do we go about decompressing that? Um, it was mentioned before, probably LZO algorithm, but re reversing that thing is probably pretty tedious. And so instead of doing that, uh, I wanted to share like a more uh, economical method, which is using Unicorn, which is like an emulator, to uh, create a standalone decompressor. And the idea here, you can load the firmware uh, in, in, into Unicorn at the correct load address, and then map the blob of data you want to decompress. Then you run the decompressing function onto it, and you read the output, and with that you should have like a working decompressor. So uh, the idea here is um, you, ha you, you create your, uh, I want to share that so that you understand it's like simple to use, and if you ever face like a similar situation, you could do as well. So you create your uh, emulator. You map like the thing. In, like, you create the memory mappings that was going to receive the the blob of uh, the, the the firmware. Sorry, and you uh, create like a stack and you um, push it to the. Uh, you, you copy in memory like the, the firmware you want to emulate. And with that function, you're ready to execute some function inside your firmware. And then. Um, 
the, this function is going to be the one that actually decompress the uh, the blob of data and you just specify you know the beginning of the function the end of the function that you find by reversing the the thing and uh, you map you map like a location for like that will receive your buffer you pass the arguments in that I was explaining before just by writing to the register and to the stack and then you just invoke it and uh, if it runs to the end it's going to terminate properly and if there's like an error scenario it's going to branch out into one of those like unmapped like print function and unicorn will throw an error but in the end like it actually works and you get the data and you just read it back and we on that and without reversing any you know algorithm code you have like a working decompressor so just to give you an idea after running that and uh, overwriting like in the firmware the um, it was compressed that's the same location i was showing you before but now like the the firmware function points to something here that uh, is the proper like prologue of the function and everything it looks nice we have all the strings and so on um, there's one more stuff uh, which is the the file system uh, of that um, device is also compressed uh, and it turns out that it starts after the uh, compressed firmware and it turns out that the first d word of our compressed firmware is its size and if we, and if we seek uh, to the to the location at after that size is the beginning of the file system which we can do there i'm not going to go over the, the same code again but by running exactly the same decompressing function we recover uh, something nice and so that's the compressed file system of our firmware and we can run binwalk on it to see what's what's in there and it says it's a pfs uh, file system and we can ask binwalk to extract that and that gives us all of the stuff which is really nice uh, plenty of tempting thing we want to look at uh, with one gotcha is like some of these files are still compressed with the same algorithm so we might have to run it again on each file individually uh, but here like the fun stuff is like we have like the cgi bin uh, folder which were like the one the stuff we wanted to look at first uh, unfortunately like when we look into it uh, it's all like one byte and it means that's not the, the actual location of the cgi so um, that was that was a bit of a bummer but basically as a result uh, the firmware looks good now in ida we can start looking at it uh, but the file, the file system was compressed and it turns out to be a PFS file system. And the CGI are empty and therefore we are like, looking in the wrong castle. Like it's not in the file system, it's like somewhere inside the, the firmware itself, like the, the, the main code. So here like the next logical step, it starts reversing that. Uh, but when I was doing my project, I was like a little ADD and I wanted to revisit uh, the Vigor 3910. Uh, that's going to be meaningful in a minute and we can see why like the previous work was all too important. Um, but the fun stuff here is um, I explained before that we could uh, recover pr prior uh, file system, um, firmware files and um, this one is a like couple of uh, revision before and you can see it doesn't look at all like the previous one uh, which is here so you can see eyeball the difference and you're like this one looks the one on the left looks much nicer nope sorry and if we run the um, entropy analysis we can see it's completely different and so the idea is if we can seamlessly upgrade from you know like the previous version to the the one that's actually encrypted it means that that firmware on the left has the means to decrypt the one on the right um, so how do we do that uh, so what was the key was how, how does that decryption works um, so uh, it's either going to be in the firmware update code that you know when you install a new update it's going to decrypt the stuff and install it or it's going to be saved in flash encrypted and going to be decrypted at boot time uh, once again doing a flash dump might help but i didn't have a device at that time so instead i just did more like reversing and looking at you know files so the vigor 3910 early boot um, inside the firmware you have a bunch of uh, thunder x files that are coming from the uh, Octeon Thunder SDK, which is the system on chip um, of the, the router that's being used to manage the data plane and, and that kind of things. So a lot of complicated stuff, but in the end, by just like scrolling around, we can find like multiple files. And one is the uh, ATF stage one. And I think I learned yesterday that ATF stands for like ARM Trust Firmware or something. And that's actually like the interesting one. Um, so if you look at the strings in it, we can see uh, b stuff like BL1, BL2, BL31 mentioned. And those are like the, uh, the various like bootloader stages of like the trusted boot of ARM. Um, and it also has like interesting strings like decrypt file and expand 32 byte K, 
Uh, that one, if you know crypto, you might know what it is, and otherwise we're going to sell in a sec. So uh, how do we recover like this BL1, BL2, etc.? Uh, turns out, according to the specs of ARM, there is this magic value here that leads you to like a table of content uh, over there, and that tells you the location of this different like stage of the bootloader. And to uh, enhance it, uh, we have like the, the beginning of the table of content, uh, like different like UID that are like defined um, in the ARM specs that tells like this that UID is BL2, that one is BL3, etc. And you have like an offset which is from computed from the beginning of the table of content and the size. So basically, if you go at that offset and crop that amount of bytes, you get BL2 in that example. Um, and turns out like BL33 is where like the fun things are, like all these like, strings, like decrypt, fi decrypt file and expense you by K are located. So that's the one we actually want to look at. And uh, so the, if you didn't know what expense 32 byte K means, um, it's the uh, initial, um, it's, the, it's, it's part of the initialization of Chacha and Salsa ciphers. Um, and in this case, it's specifically um, Chacha. When I was working on my slides, I was like, okay, so what, how I can share the difference between Chacha and Salsa to explain how I identify that? So I Googled it and I was like, uh, yeah, no, that's not what, that's, that, that's, that, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was like, oh, that's why they call like that. But uh, no, really, like that's, that's the difference. Uh, that's from Wikipedia, better source than Google, I guess. Where like you can just like you can look at the initialization vector of your uh, cipher and you decide whether it's which. And they have the best uh, key mangling scheme I've ever seen. I'm really it, it's it's really great. Uh, so of course uh, they use a plain text key that contains three text string and some JSON. Uh, I, I don't know why. And then it looks for JSON. You know, like that guy. And uh, then it replaces the J in the JSON by an E. So like the key become JTEC E zone something. And it's like, why? I mean, am I, is, it, is, it really, is it really what's going on? But yeah, uh, so in the end with this like five lines of Python, you can actually decrypt the firmware. And so I'm thinking that was like the like engineering process for the, uh, the, the ciphering of the, um, of the firmware, like the 4.0 firmware. Uh, okay, oh, sorry. So we have decrypted the firmware, so now what? Uh, once again, we like to run binwork on stuff, and it tells us like somehow there's like a PE file at the beginning. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, and then we see stuff like bin bash, and it's like, is it, is it really what I think? And so I grabbed for Linux, and yeah, it turns out that this device is running Linux. That was like, not what I was expecting, I guess, uh, but that's the way, it, that's the thing. So like, okay, I want to see the file system now, like, uh, you know, like Etsy password or some whatever, the, whatever is like on the device. Um, so it turns out the file system is embedded in the Linux kernel and the Linux kernel is somehow that P file I just highlighted. Uh, I think it's some like U-boot arm um, stuff. I'm not sure why it is, but that's the way it is. Uh, so we can extract the Linux kernel with binwalk and then import that in IDA and see how it decompresses the file system. In most situations, binwork would be good enough to find the file system on its own, but this time it didn't work. So that's why we have to do it. And so we search for strings like that mention decompression. We follow the cross-reference uh, of that string. And then eventually we find the decompressed stuff function that's supposedly decompressed stuff. And we can see here, like um, we have a, a pointer to a compressed buffer. And the first byte, or the first D word, sorry, of that is uh, this number. I don't know that number, but I was like, just in case I'm going to Google it. And it turns out it's a LZ4 uh, frame description. So without having to figure out like what the fuck the decompressed stuff is doing, we know that it's um, LZ4. So the idea, we can just dump that, run LZ4 on it, and we have decompressed what we wanted to decompress. That being said, it's kind of tedious, like if you want to do it multiple times, because you know, like importing the stuff in IDA, following the cross ref, it's annoying. So we could try to automate it in uh, kind of like IDA, like LS mode or something, but that's also tedious. So I was just like, fuck it, just uh, let's search for strings, you know, like we can look for this magic value and by observation, the end of the LZ4 uh, data and with like trailer. So we can just look for that and try to extract that and then run LZ4 on what we've just extracted. And uh, with like a little script like that, that does the trick and this way we can automate uh, the analysis of multiple versions of the same firmware. 
So we, what we got, I'm almost done with that part. I need that. Uh, we got a CPIO file system, and this one can be like mounted or extracted. So that's cool. Uh, and it's just like regular Linux stuff. But there's a firmware folder in it that looks pretty fun. Uh, looking at it, I hope you can read, but on the left, it says like set up QMU Linux. It's like, what? Why is it running QMU? Like, the fuck is going on here? And on the right side, uh, we have like a Soho, uh, Soho D64.bin, which by looking at it, turns out to be the same uh, DreOS bare metal firmware we were looking at before on the, on the MIPS one. Or at least this one is for Arch64, but that's the same stuff. So really the way that device works is like it runs Linux. And then on Linux, it runs QEMU that emulates the same bare metal firmware that is being shared, like the code base that is being shared by these like 20 different devices. So it's like, okay, that's cool. So now we can hack stuff, right? Um, the normal process would be like, we can import that in IDA, uh, so that's an Audrey OS image, and then look for the CGI endpoints. But honestly, at that point, I was like, wait a minute, like this QMU stuff, that's too tempting. It's like, I want to look at that. Like if, if, it's, uh, like if Linux is emulating Dre OS, you know, I can run Linux, I can run a QMU, I want to do the same, you know, that would be like so much, so helpful, you know, for, to do fun research. So let's look at that first. Um, it turns out they have a really cool like uh, run linux.sh script, you know, in the in the file system, and it does a bunch of stuff like mapping a bunch of things in memory, uh, creating strings. I'm not quite sure, uh, but it does it for you, so that's cool. Uh, but there is one flag here, like the DTB Draytech, that looks sketchy. Like DTB, like that flag normally on QMU take a file, and Draytech is not a file. And so yeah, that's not a legit uh, QMU flag, and it turns out they have a custom built. Uh, custom build of QMU. At that point, I was like, oh, I'm so close of being able to run it, but uh, there's that problem. And I was like, should I just try to reverse the QMU, see the modifications, binary patch my QMU to make it work? I actually tried, that's a terrible idea, I do not recommend. And instead, there's like a much more funky way, which is they have like a G whole like GPL uh, repository. And you can go there and find the GPL stuff for the Vigor 3910 that leads to like their version of QMU. And if you grab that, you can see all the modifications they've made. And surprisingly, you can just compile that from source and it works seamlessly, like the, the compilation just works fine. Now I was like, I'm going to spend a day like making it work with all the dependencies. No, it just worked. I was like, well, oh, that's cool. And so I run my script and it actually boots. Like that on the right side is the console that you'd have if you plug the console cable uh, on your on your device, and all of that is a chunk of like QMU uh, starting. So that's really great, and also answer to pings. You know, I had to create a few like network interface and stuff for that to to work. But yeah, once again, I was just following the script. But the answer to ping, so you know, it it really works. Uh, but then I tried to connect the web interface, and I had that. So I was I was really sad. Um, and I was like, what's going on? So I, I started like staring into the abyss and be like, what did I do wrong? What's, you know, what's the errors of my ways? And also I spent like quite some time re reading all the scripts they had on the device. And eventually I found this magic comment here, um, which basically what it does is it disables some hardware offloading. So, you know, that's, that's something that fancy devices have to, you know, ha compute like CRC on hardware or something. But clearly, I'm not, a, I'm not a switch. I don't have that fancy hardware. So disabling it makes sense. And once it was disabled, we get to that point where we actually get like a nice uh, interface and we can start like interacting with the stuff. So that was great. I was like, it works. I was like, I can start like hacking stuff. So yeah, let's reverse stuff. Just so to uh, give some tips and tricks so that I get started with that, that system is really verbose. So you have like crash handlers that when something crashes, it's going to print like a whole call stack with function names. So, you know, the system knows as like association, function address, function name. And the same goes for like global variables in a certain location. So that's a good idea to start renaming everything that you can uh, because that's sort of like an oracle to like understand the stuff without having to reverse everything. Uh, just to give you an example, that's two region of code, like this one creating like variables and this one creating that big like table of uh, function name, function addresses. So if you're good, you can pay me automate it. I think I did that one by hand by just copy and pasting and renaming. It's pretty tedious, but it's extremely useful for reversing. And so yeah, where are the CGI? Um, as I said before, uh, they're not in the PFS file system and instead they're inside the DreOS uh, mon monolithic firmware. It's just that big stuff that's going to implement all the CGI itself. So let's go in either. 
the good way to do that is to search for the strings. You know, we have like the list of like all the CGI. And because we're working with an embedded system, we don't have ASLR, like everything is at, you know, like a known location in memory. And usually you can expect to just be able to search for like the address of the strings and you will find direct reference to them. So that you can do just follow, follow those emitted values and eventually you find something like that, which is a big table that has like a, a struct that is like a pointer to a function, a, a pointer to a, a string, which is the CGI endpoint a pointer to a function, that's the handler for that CGI, and then some flags that um, say if it's enabled or something. So yeah, I was like, yeah, let's reverse all the CGI, let's go. Uh, there's like something like 100 of them, I, I counted this morning, I was like, that, that's, that's not practical, you know, that's, that's too much work. Uh, so I was like, maybe I can start with, you know, finding, you know, a bug in authentication, you know, maybe some function should be authenticated and they're not. And there were like this cool string like S form or STR. There's like that's clearly about authentication. Turns out it's not. It's about like CS, uh, cross, it's to prevent like cross side uh, scripting. So completely waste of time. And I was like completely dead end. And I was like, okay, let's uh, let's take a step back and understand how the authentication flow works, so that you know we don't rush in stupid stuff. So here's the uh, the, the login page, and it get it. Um, it's how you log into the, the, the portal. And then uh, if you look at the source, uh, you have like username and password uh, written in like super lit way, you know, obfuscation, I guess. And they uh, pipe that into uh, AA and AB fields in the in a form. But before moving on, they base64 encode that. I don't know why, maybe more obfuscation. And eventually they uh, post it to the wlogin.cgi. So we can look at the W login at the CGI because we did the work of locating all this stuff. And for instance, you have like this nice function name, get CGI by field name that we renamed because you know we, we located those stuff. Uh, and it does what you would expect. You recover the AA and AB fields and then it pass it to the uh, base64 decode function. That function takes uh, a buffer like, like here on the stack uh, that's going to be the destination for decoding the base64 string, a size and the, like a pointer to the data, normal stuff. And then there is that weird function here uh, that computes the uh, expected size of the decoded string. And to do that, it, uh, divide, it take the length of the base64 string, divide it by four, multiply it by three, and then remove the padding, like the equal signs at the end. Uh, and when I was reversing that, I was like, what, the, what is that? Like, what, what are they doing? You know, and it's like, you know, some byte logic and stuff. And here, like, that's the, um, that's the loop that keeps iterating, like looking for like equal signs and keep decrementing the expected um, expected like uh, destination size or dec decoded size. But I, I don't know if you can like eyeball it, but there's something sketchy here because the, um, you can keep adding more equal sign to your payload and it's keep going, it's going to keep decrementing the expected decoded size. So if you send like 1,000 bytes and 3,000 equal signs after that, it's going to be like, oh yeah, that's size zero or five or minus one or I don't know. But you know, you can do the math and you know, have like something super wrong that is going to be assumed that it fits into the stack buffer. But really it's going to decode it in place and you end up with a stupid like stack based buffer overflow. So I was like, okay, well, that's that was what I was expecting, but let's hack that. And it turns out we're playing in easy mode. Uh, as I said, there is no SLR. The stack is, is executable because, yeah, of course it is. And because we're playing with like an AirTOS system, uh, the stack and the buffer are like always at the same location anyway, so we can just hard code the, the addresses. But that being said, uh, there's like some challenges. We're talking about JOS, not Linux. So, you know, if we want to do something meaningful, we should have to reverse JOS and understand how it works, which is a lot of work. Um, and at least for the uh, the R64 one, the Vigor 3910, it's executing within QMU. So we feel like, oh, maybe we can mess with the underlying Linux. You know, we would have to escape QMU, which is like, you know, good luck with that. So yeah, we're running inside QMU, right? Um, let me introduce our friends, uh, the exe Linux command, which is a really convenient function that send a message to the host, the Linux, over a socket, you know, from within JOS. And the host, like the, the, the server that received that, is nice. And it's going to pass that and call system on it. Uh, and of course, it's running as root because, you know, so it's great. We, we have a free uh, VM escape, you know, in VM escape. And so, yeah, that, that, that works well. So the plan next is just uh, to make an exploit for that. 
we can hard code everything that's thanks to the authors. And because we're running on QMU, we can attach GDB to it, start debugging and figuring out the offsets and tweaking the stuff uh, to make it work right. And eventually we jump to a buffer and we do whatever. Uh, my process was printing hack the planet in the console with like the console print function. Uh, but eventually, like we could just replace hack the planet by uh, like an actual like reverse shell payload and call Excel Linux command instead. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, that's a really quick video of uh, the hack the planet one. Uh, here is the um, the console. Here is the exploit, and uh, hopefully that's going to play. It's really anticlimactic. Uh, we run the exploit, and it prints like the planet. So woo, we hack the planet. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, if we look at the real device, uh, that's the one I got. Like when I was at that stage, I was like, okay, now I need to buy one to hack something real, you know, like uh, no way. Uh, so I was like, let's get that. Um, and it comes, as I said, with the console cable, so like a similar console we were looking at. Uh, and the problem is like it's a um, it's a locked down shell, you know. We don't have like you know run shit on the Linux and and whatnot. And on top of that, it requires the username and admin password, so that's not like a, an attack vector or anything. Uh, but when I was reversing the all the scripts, I found that one, which is like also pretty spicy. So that's the one that um, print the menu like in that console I was showing you. And they've been really nice, and they explain you that there is a cheat code, and if you tap Z uh, ten times. Is going to drop you into a Linux shell. Okay, thanks. Like, I would have missed it if it weren't for that comment. I was just like, I would completely overlooked it. And so with that, sorry, I don't have a screenshot for the shell, but it's just like you can um, tweak, like you know, understand how the system works, figure out like the network interface, and debug the actual the real payload you want to do because you know, like you have an admin sh like a root shell on the device to debug the root shell you want to create. So that that was really convenient. Uh, and so yeah, in the end, that crazy uh, payload that uh, configured the Linux interface on the on the router, uh, give it an IP address, and then uh, connect to the attacker uh, machine. I think that one would work over the internet. Uh, maybe I tried a different one, but yeah. And of course, he has netcat, right? Because I don't know. That's... And with the e uh, command. So that that's how it looks like. I have a better video in five sec, but yeah, we we run it. We have a root shell. That's cool. Uh, so that's good, we, we made it. 200,000 devices uh, vulnerable on Shodan uh, a couple of months ago. It can actually be turned into a one-click attack for like the one that, are, that don't have that management interface enabled. Uh, but really, uh, exploiting the, the bare metal firmware, which is a majority of them, it's much harder. And that's something I kind of try to tackle briefly, but like, yeah, that's, that's way more effort and that's not worth the, the time spent. Like I, I don't have like interest in doing that. Uh, and that's also really good because that means like set actors would also have like a harder time doing it. So what happened post exploitation? Um, what would the attacker do? Uh, you know, like from the zero at and the, the CISA report and etc. We know that um, they could leak secrets like stored on the device. So you know, like hard coded like passwords, maybe like some keys. Uh, it's also, they've also been known to like tamper with some of the settings, like configuring a rogue uh, DNS server. So that every request done would be sent to their server instead of you know the normal one, and with that, um, either man, man in the middle, you know HTTP connection, like not HTTPS obviously, or just like create like um, statistics of which uh, you know website or services are like visited by the, the people in the net targeted network. You can also enable like port mirroring and do some form of man in the middle, and. Um, you can also pivot to other devices on the LAN and exfiltrate data. Um, so I have a quick video, like on on the um, to demo all of that. I created like a network with like a bunch of devices and uh, show we can hack all the stuff. But like for, for the, because I don't have like you know uh, enough time, I'm just going to show like a little part of it. Uh, if you're curious, I have a, a link at the end to the whole video. But basically, we run our exploits and uh, we get a reverse shell. Uh, and then we can download SOCAT from like the internet and the attacker machine so that we get a better shell. You can see here, oh, that didn't stop. So, so we get like a better shell and we can cut the config file of the device and it shows you nice, nicely you get the uh, admin password of the web interface. And then we can download NMAP uh, once again from the attacker machine that would be on the internet. 
and uh, scan the network, the, the LAN. Uh, eventually, I found like one of the, the, the machine I put on my on my network, which is a web server, and we can use SOCAT to uh, port forward from the LAN to the Draytech and from the Draytech to the um, the attacker machine and forward the whole communication. And it turns out in that case, it's a, it's a GitLab server. Um, the idea being uh, in in the demo, the full demo, it's you know a vuln like a not updated. Uh, GitLab server, and so you can run an NDA an attack and compromise like the infra infrastructure and so on. Uh, so yeah, so that that's what would happen in a somewhat realistic attack scenario, I think. Next step, I was like, okay, so what's all the firmware like vulnerable for that? So I tried to like download all the all the firmware and see when the bug was introduced. And it turns out it was introduced in mid or late 2018. I put the version number like that I identified. And as I said, there's like over 20 different models affected. Um, that being said, the ones that were targeted by China were like not among these um, devices. There was different code base and stuff. Uh, so different problems. And uh, just as a funny uh, conclusion remark or something, when I was doing that work of looking at all the, uh, the firmware versions, I looked at that one in orange. And I, I was already done, like reversing all the stuff, like doing the stuff. And when I imported that one in IDA, uh, and by the way, the the SOD 64 bit is a valid L file. When I imported in IDA, uh, IDA showed that, and then it showed that, and so that version has all the symbols. So I was like, huh, maybe I should have done that before, not after, <laughs> next time. Uh, but yeah, so if you guys ever want to look at that, that that that's a good uh, head start. Um, so yeah, for disclosure and mitigation, uh, I would recommend you to update your device if one someone in the room has like one of those. Uh, Draytech was really good. They patched the thing in like under like 30 days, I think. Uh, when we notified them, they were like really responsive and uh, sent us like beta to test and so on. So good job, Draytech, for fixing the, the problems. And if you really want to put your stuff on the internet, at least you can enable some like IP filtering or geo restriction to uh, decrease the chance of getting pwned by China or who knows, uh, but that won't help for like a one click attack. Like uh, if someone on your LAN visits a malicious website uh, that sends like a post post request to that W login that CGI, like that, that won't save you. Uh, and yeah, and somehow you can monitor what's going on to that web login.htm uh, file. You could look for, uh, you know, sketchy base 64 strings with way too much uh, padding and flag that or for your only pot maybe. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Uh, so yeah, as a conclusion, uh, it's a bit of a non sequitur, but um, remember, like those devices are mostly used apparently by small and medium-sized businesses, and in our industry, like you know, like if it's not a Fortune 500, it's easy to like ignore them, but uh, small and medium-sized businesses are like 50% of the U.S. economy or something. So, you know, as an aggregate, they are really important, and yeah, update your routers. Uh, there is like a short uh, blog uh, that uh, provides detection guidance and a full demo video uh, that I didn't have time today. So if you want, you can check it out. And uh, yeah, I have, uh, I think, two minutes for questions. Uh, so you can either ask now or find me later. Thank you.